Living with Awareness by Sangharachita, Windhorse Publications, 2003, read by Subhadra. Beginning. Quote from the Pali Satipatthana Sutta. Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country at a town of the Kurus named Kama Sadama. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, this is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, namely, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. The term mindfulness crops up in some of the most important formulations of the Buddha's teaching. It is one of the seven factors of enlightenment. It is one of the five spiritual faculties. And it is also one of the limbs of the Noble Eightfold Path. Here, in the teaching called the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha appears to suggest that mindfulness is nothing less than the whole of the path, the, quote, direct way for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation. This is perhaps one reason why the Satipatthana Sutta is held in such high esteem in the Theravadin Buddhist tradition, which is still practiced in many parts of the world today. Many Theravadins are able to recite the entire sutta from memory. But in the Mahayana tradition also, and throughout the Buddhist world, mindfulness continues to be recognised as fundamental to spiritual growth. And it is the Satipatthana Sutta, upon which this book is based, that gives us the clearest and most detailed account of why this should be so. The teaching was given, so we are told in its opening words, among the Kuru people who lived at the time of the Buddha, around 500 BCE, somewhere in the area of what is now Delhi, in northwestern India. We are given no other clues as to the circumstances in which the discourse was given, but we can guess, going on accounts of similar occasions in the Pali texts, that the Buddha was probably staying among a small group of bhikkhus, or itinerant monks, who were dwelling in little huts, dotted about somebody's park or garden, or simply living under the trees. In some texts, we find the Buddha instructing his companion Ananda to gather all the bhikkhus together so that he can address them. Presumably, this would have happened when there were a number of them living over a large area. But if there were only a few of them around, the Buddha would probably have called them together himself. And this seems to have been what happened upon this occasion, perhaps once the bhikkhus had returned from their arms round in the nearby town of Kamasadama. The Buddha often taught in response to a question put by Ananda or one of the other disciples, or by someone else he happened to meet. Sometimes a lay person, or a follower of another teacher, would seek him out to ask him a question, or try to catch him out on a point of logic. In some cases, the question had to be asked not once, but three times. Apparently, the Buddha would always answer a question on the third time of asking, whatever the consequences for the questioner. But here he seems to call the monks together himself, with the intention of giving them what we can infer he considers to be a very important teaching. The, quote, direct way, as he tells them, for the purification of beings. This sense of a unified way is emphasised throughout the Buddha's teaching. It is what the path is in principle, as distinct from all the different presentations of it. The Dharma finds expression in many formulations. There is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the fourth of the Four Noble Truths and the threefold path of morality, meditation and wisdom. While in the Mahayana tradition, 
the path of the Bodhisattva is central, with its vow to liberate all beings and its training in these six or ten perfections. One can't say that any one presentation of the doctrine or any one method is the best under all circumstances and for all people. But for all the diversity of these presentations of the Buddhist path, each in its own way embodies the same spiritual principles. Of course, there is a view of spiritual development that goes further than this, to regard all the world's religious teachings as equally valid paths to the goal, holding that, just as all roads lead to Rome, the truth to which all spiritual paths lead is the same truth, expressed in different ways. Perhaps the image of the path is misleading. Although many of the world's religious teachings use it, they are not necessarily using it to describe the same thing. One obvious difference is that, unlike Christianity, Islam and even Hindu Vedic philosophy, Buddhism teaches that the highest being in the universe is not a god, but an enlightened human being, and that the state of enlightenment, which is the goal of Buddhist practice, is attainable through one's own efforts to transform one's consciousness. This transformation is made possible by the principle which, as the Buddha states throughout the Pali Canon, is the essence of the path, the principle of conditionality, the truth that whatever exists owes its arising to causes and conditions. That is, things change, we change, and we have the capacity to direct that change towards spiritual growth and development. This is the guiding principle of the Buddhist path. It is the means by which our consciousness is transformed, transcended, enlightened. The Buddhist outlook is profoundly optimistic. The greed, aversion and delusion of the unenlightened mind are universal problems, but human consciousness, wherever it arises, also shares the same spiritual potential. From a Buddhist perspective, any religious teaching can be said to lead towards enlightenment to the extent that it enables and encourages the individual to develop spiritual qualities. And if it leaves some qualities out, or encourages the development of qualities that are inimical to spiritual growth, examples of this readily come to mind, of course, it cannot be regarded as an expression of the path at all, and this must be acknowledged if real growth is to be possible. From this, we can work out a basic definition of mindfulness. The, quote, direct way for the purification of beings, unquote, is the sum total of the ethical and spiritual qualities that a human being must develop in order to reach what Buddhists call enlightenment. But mindfulness is more than just a mixture of all these aspects of the path. It is a distinct spiritual faculty the defining quality of all Buddhist practice. And according to the words attributed to the Buddha in the Satipatthana Sutta, one learns to practice it by attending to four basic aspects or foundations of mindfulness. The Sutta. What are the four? Here, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put aside covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating feelings as feelings, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. The term satipatthana combines mindfulness or sati with building up or making firm, patana. 
and as its name suggests, the concern of the Satipatthana Sutta is the development of a continuity of mindful positivity across the whole field of human consciousness. To give us a more specific idea of what this means, the Sutta classifies this mindfulness according to what are called the four foundations of mindfulness. In Pali, the ancient Indian language in which this teaching was first written down, these are mindfulness of rupa or form, usually taken to mean one's own physical body, mindfulness of vedana or feelings, mindfulness of chitta, which in this context means thoughts, and mindfulness of dhammas, dhammas being in this context the objects of the mind's attention. By establishing these four foundations, one cultivates the conditions for the arising of ever more positive and refined states of consciousness. The same word for this establishing appears in its Sanskrit form in the establishment aspect of the relative bodhicitta, the prasthana citta of the Mahayana schools. Alongside the Bodhisattva vow, this involves the cultivation of the six or ten perfections in a practice which, like that of the four foundations of mindfulness, progressively harmonizes its different aspects into an increasingly dedicated commitment to the path. While the word foundation gives a good sense of the mental stability developed through practicing this teaching, we are not to imagine anything static. These foundations are not to be laid down like blocks of granite. Like the motifs of a symphony or the basic steps of a ballet, they are the essence of continuous dynamic development. Mindfulness harmonizes and unifies every aspect of Buddhist practice into a concentrated responsive awareness of body, feelings, mind and mental objects. Perhaps the most apt analogy, again from the arts, is to say that being truly mindful is like playing a musical instrument, with oneself as both instrument and player. A violinist doesn't give a bit of attention to the score, then a bit of attention to her fingers on the strings, then a bit of attention to the conductor. To play well, she has to bring about a fusion between herself and what she is doing, a fusion almost between her awareness and its object. Everything must come together in a single rich experience of energy and expressive skill. She is fully absorbed, yet at the same time keenly aware of every movement she makes. This heightened state of awareness is what we need to aim for. Body and mind fully engaged in a state of clarity and positivity that saturates and colours the whole of our experience. And this is surely a state much to be desired, not a duty, but a great pleasure. This is the aim, everything coming together in a smooth flow. But, just as the violinist needs to work on the details of her technique to achieve the full effect, so we need to pay careful attention to the details of our mindfulness practice, that is, to each of the four foundations, and to further details within each of the four. The Buddha therefore proceeds to elaborate on each foundation in turn, to make the nature of the practice clear. This detailed and specific approach helps to counteract the tendency to overgeneralize the nature of spiritual development. It is sometimes said that the aim of Buddhist practice is to attain insight into the true nature of things, and that is fair enough, in a way. But the nature of that insight is not a general, abstract understanding, and it will not come about by chance. A great deal of preparation is needed, first to clarify one's consciousness, and then to develop a state of receptivity 
into which the essential truths of the Buddha's teaching can be introduced. And according to tradition, much of this preparation is best done through the vigorous and creative practice of meditation. It has become a commonplace of contemporary Buddhist teaching that we can learn to be mindful while eating, doing the washing up, and so on. And we certainly can, indeed must. We can be mindful, that is, we can be preparing ourselves for the attainment of insight in all the circumstances of our lives. And the Satipatthana Sutta takes full account of this, as we shall see. At the same time, as so often in the Pali Canon, the emphasis is placed on the practice of meditation as the basis of the whole process. What kind of meditation? In the Buddhist tradition, meditation practices are generally classified as being of two kinds, shamatha, or calming, and vipassana, or insight. Through shamatha meditation, one develops mindfulness of the body and an ardent, energetic one-pointedness of mind, building up an intensity and subtlety of concentration on the basis of which a deeper, more far-reaching understanding can be developed. At this point, you broaden the scope of your concentration by introducing some method of insight meditation designed to help you to experience the truths of the Buddha's teaching, not just as religious or philosophical ideas, but as tangible realities. As we shall see, the distinction between these two kinds of meditation is not as clear-cut as it is sometimes thought to be. The mindfulness of breathing, for example, is far more than a simple concentration technique, and the Satipatthana Sutta encompasses both types of practice. All this will be the stuff of this commentary. But before we home in on the details, we will be working through the text a section at a time. In the next two chapters, we will consider two aspects of mindfulness that are pertinent to all aspects of its practice. Memory and mindfulness of purpose. Chapter 1. Remembering The Pali term sati is usually translated into English as mindfulness, which in Western Buddhist circles has come to be associated with a keen attention to one's present experience. This is not wrong. Awareness of the present moment is certainly crucial to self-transformation. But mindfulness is not just a spotlight focused on the present. True, learning to develop the kinds of concentration that is so intense that you are conscious of nothing outside your present experience is important to spiritual growth. But to attain transcendental insight, you need to appreciate the true nature of such intense experiences. While staying receptive to and being enlivened by the whole range of your present experience, you also try to wake up to the true significance of that experience which involves awareness both of the past and of the future. This is brought out by the literal translation of sati, in other words, recollection, memory, recalling the mind. Just as important as the impressions we receive through our senses, including the mind, are the ways we understand those sensations, the knowledge and previous experience that impinge upon the present, colouring it and allowing meaning to arise. Memory is what enables us to recollect ourselves in the present moment, and without it we cannot experience anything fully, however strongly focused we are on the present situation. One of Charles Dickens' Christmas books called The Haunted Man illustrates this very well. It concerns a learned professor of chemistry whose past contains a particularly painful episode, the memory of which weighs continually on his mind, dragging him down into a deep depression. It is Christmas, and as the frost and snow close in upon his lonely room, 
the scientists' memories somehow coalesce into a ghostly doppelganger, a mirror image of himself, announcing that it has come to make a bargain with him. This figure offers him the power to banish all his recollections, and with them the intertwined chain of feelings and associations that depend upon them. After some deliberation, the scientist accepts the offer, which brings with it not only the ability to forget his own past, but also the power to remove, at a touch of his hand, all trace of memory from anyone he approaches. Thinking this a real benefit to humanity, he begins to go about the city, touching various people he knows. Just as the phantom promised, their memories begin to disappear. The significance of the phantom's bargain is, of course, its moral effect. For each of the people affected, the consequences of losing their memory turn out to be entirely negative. As the recollection of their past life slips away, they start to disintegrate as moral beings, becoming, by degrees, more and more mean and selfish. So much of what is good in them is bound up with their past, that once memory begins to fade, their selflessness and compassion is supplanted by a calculating indifference. Take the Tetterbys, for example, a poor and hard-working couple who are just managing to scrape by and feed their seven children. They are kept going by their strong sense of interdependence and mutual affection. But once the scientist has brushed past them, their sense of themselves starts to disappear, together with their memories of their shared struggles and their concern for each other and their children. Gone are their memories of their youthful times together, their courtship and marriage. Now they are only aware of what they can see in the present. Mrs. Tetterby can see only a shabby, bald old man, with no noble or attractive features to redeem his worn-out appearance while her husband sees only a fat and unprepossessing woman who is well past her prime. Any sense of what they once meant to each other dissolves into a mean-spirited grasping after petty gains and immediate enjoyments. As the scientist begins to learn, without the capacity to recollect the past, there can be no real friendship, no real love. Things lose their meaning and our humanity ebbs away. The moral of the story is that the function of memory is inseparably connected with the ability to act ethically towards one's fellow human beings. Our moral responsiveness to the world around us, which is central to our spiritual development, functions by accessing memory through the application of mindfulness, but also through the emotional connections that memory delivers. Retrieving memories is not a mechanical process like rewinding a tape recorder. Our recollections come back to us in the form of emotions, which grow stronger as scenes and events re-emerge in our minds. Once those emotions are rekindled, be they pleasant or painful, they illuminate all the small details of the situation that would otherwise have been lost to us. The greater the importance to you of an event, the more vivid will be your emotional associations with it, and generally the more fully you will be able to recall it. We remember our first deep friendships, the first time we fell in love, the first books or music that made a deep impression upon us, and we have powerful and meaningful memories of events which others who were present at the time might have entirely forgotten, because to them they were insignificant. When elderly people recall events from a distant past very clearly, although they can't remember what happened just last week, this is not necessarily due to the diminishing mental powers of old age. It might simply be that, set against the pattern of one's whole life, certain impressions and experiences stand out more distinctly because of their formative influence.
Sometimes, of course, we do forget events that have strong emotional associations. But this bears out the idea that memory and emotions are inextricably linked. We might forget some experiences because we are repressing our difficult feelings about them. It is entirely natural to wish we could forget the sorrow, the wrong and the trouble we have known. But if we did, how could we learn from life and move on? All our experience, pleasant and unpleasant, is part of who we are now. We need to find ways of recontacting our past if we are to become fully formed individuals. Dickens himself was able to use his great powers of imagination to unlock his memories. He once tried to write his autobiography, but quickly became aware that he had lost access to some periods in his early childhood because the memories associated with them were so painful. His solution was to write David Copperfield, an autobiographical novel into which he incorporated many of those early experiences. By writing about himself in the character of David Copperfield and his father in the character of Mr. Micawber, he brought up those hidden memories in a way that enabled him to be objective about them, and thus at last to liberate himself from them. Retrieving repressed memories is of course the stuff of much contemporary therapy, but we should consider the purpose of retrieving them. It is a question of our vision of human existence, and here Buddhism goes further than most psychotherapeutic models, although some do have a spiritual dimension. As we recollect ourselves, as we retrieve and integrate what has been scattered, we do so with a sense of where we are going, a sense of a future goal. This also then must be included in our definition of mindfulness, and it is the subject of our next chapter. Chapter 2. Goal Setting Mindfulness may begin with calling past experience to mind, gathering together the parts of ourselves that have been scattered across time. But the whole idea of learning from the past implies an orientation towards the future. What we learn from experience will help us anticipate the likely fruits of present action, and this demands a concern for our future life and a sense that what will happen is, at least to some extent, in our own hands. Mindfulness thus involves awareness not only of where we have come from, but also of where we are going. A Pali term associated with this awareness of the future is Sampajanya, which is usually translated as mindfulness of purpose or clear comprehension, the implication being that everything we do should be done with a sense of the direction in which we want to move in, and of whether or not our current action will take us in that direction. How can we be aware of the future? I'm not talking about developing a kind of sooth-saying faculty. We cannot be sure of the exact course that events will take, but we can take our stand on the most basic truth the Buddha taught, the truth that actions have consequences. We can be quite certain that what we do now will have a decisive effect on what will happen in the future. I am talking, of course, about karma, which must be one of the most misused words to have entered the English language through contact with the East. When something unexpected happens, people often say, that's my karma as though karma was some sort of bad luck or fate about which nothing can be done. But karma simply means action. It is what you do. When people talk about karma, what they usually mean is what is known in Pali as vipaka, the results or fruits of action, which, sooner or later, one inevitably experiences as a result of having done something, performed a karma in the past. Karma is more than simple cause and effect, however. It is to do with the moral weight of an action, and this is how it comes to be so important to the spiritual life. 
ethically skillful action in Pali Sila is the foundation of any higher spiritual experience. It is not a completely straightforward matter to determine whether or not any given action is skillful, because it has nothing to do with any external set of rules by which behaviour might be judged. It is determined by the state of consciousness out of which something is done. Things done when you are in a state of neurotic desire or aversion or mental confusion will have karmically negative effects, while an action performed out of love, understanding and clarity of mind will lead to happiness. When you act on a skillful volition, that positivity will grow and bear fruit in the form of skillful, inspiring states of mind. It is not always possible to discern the detailed workings of karma, because by no means everything we experience is the result of what we have done in the past. But sometimes, when we find ourselves in a strangely familiar situation, we may look back over a period of years and identify a recurring cycle of events, most obviously perhaps in the way we conduct our personal relationships. You may have a tendency to blame other people for the way things turn out, or to shrug your shoulders and put it all down to circumstances or coincidence. But once it has dawned on you that the same thing is happening again and again, it might occur to you that this might be connected with some aspect of your own makeup. You might even realize that you yourself are setting up that recurring situation, even though it may be very painful through your own actions. This is clear comprehension at work. You look deeper within yourself, learn something, make amends, and find a new determination to change the way you behave in that sort of situation. This sense of moral continuity is absolutely essential to the idea of oneself as an individual. Animals, driven by instinct and a sort of habit knowledge, cannot reflect upon courses of action and make choices in the way that human beings can. To be human is to inhabit a realm in which ethical responsibility is not only possible but requisite. Thus, mindfulness must be understood to be more than simple concentration. We need to be as clear as we can about the nature of what we are doing and why. A murderer intent upon his or her victim is certainly concentrating, but that kind of single-mindedness is very different from the ethical attentiveness that characterises a state of true mindfulness. Recollecting what you have done, what you have experienced, and how you have felt in the past gives you a sense of the effects of your actions on the overall course of your life. If you reflect on what this tells you about yourself, you get a more objective view of yourself as the product of what you have done and said and even thought in the past. You can then begin to see the direction your life is taking, or could take, if you were to act differently. As you discern the overall pattern of development, you may glimpse the possibility of further progress, as your ideals and aims begin to stand out more simply and clearly than before. It is hard to get this objective perspective, to see ourselves as others see us, and this is why friendship is so valuable to spiritual growth. The ways in which our past actions have made us who we are now may not always be clear to us, but they will be obvious enough to a friend to whom we have disclosed something of our personal history. The transactions of friendship always include exchanging information about one another's past, and as a friend one should be prepared to give a sympathetic ear to the recollections of one's companions, as well as tactfully helping them to make sense of their recollections. The past is always present in us, and if you can appreciate what someone has been through, a hard childhood, or an unhappy marriage, or an unpleasant or demanding job, you can appreciate them better as they are now. 
Best of all is to tell your life story as a continuous narrative, whether you write it down or, better still, tell it to your friends. If you can speak in confidence to people you trust, you are free to be frank and take your communication deep, and to have such open communication received can be a powerful, even cathartic experience. Communication has a momentum of its own, and you can find yourself saying things about yourself that you had never even thought about before. It is as if the person listening acts as a sort of catalyst. You are not always aware of what is there until it is disclosed. But as a result, you can sometimes find a clear thread running through your life, revealing all your disparate and complex experience as the manifestation of a single developing individuality. According to the Buddhist way of seeing things, the process by which skillful and unskillful actions bear fruit in our experience is not confined to our present existence. This lifetime represents the tip of the iceberg with respect to our karma. Indeed, one's very embodiment as a human being is said to be the result of one's previous karma. If a certain situation seems to crop up again and again in your life for no obvious reason, it could be that you are experiencing the karmic effects of actions performed in previous lifetimes. In the case of a negative experience, it is generally said that it may be the result of unskillful karma if it repeats itself even after you've made every effort to make sure that it doesn't keep happening. However, although you cannot do anything about it directly, you can certainly apply spiritual remedies. You can counteract the future effects of past unskillfulness by creating a counterbalancing weight of ethically skillful action. In the first place, you can accept and bear the fruits of your unskillful karma mindfully and patiently. Secondly, you can take positive steps to cultivate the skillful above and beyond just avoiding unskillful reactions. For example, if you had some inkling that you had been habitually cruel in some past existence, or if you knew perfectly well that you had been cruel in this one, you would have a particularly strong motivation to go out of your way to be kind and considerate to others in whatever way you could. The interesting implication of this observation is that, as a general rule, the more suffering is visited upon someone the more compelling reason that person has to be kind to others. It is worth repeating that not every painful occurrence is the result of our own actions. Other kinds of conditionality may be at work. But the practice of kindly speech and action is going to be the most reliable recourse in any case. Whatever one has to suffer as a result of past action, one can be quite certain that ethically skillful actions will eventually bear positive fruit. It is always worth making the effort to be skillful. Thirdly, one can create particularly weighty positive karma by the effective practice of meditation. And fourthly, one can become enlightened, which is obviously the most conclusive answer to negative karma. You are then assured of no further rebirths in the six realms of conditioned existence, and therefore of no further suffering beyond this life. Though in the human life remaining to you, there will still be the afflictions attendant upon any human life of sickness, old age and death. Amongst these afflictions there may even be some negative karma vipaka. According to tradition, the Buddha himself had to suffer in this way when his cousin Devadatta tried to kill him by rolling a stone down a hill onto him. Although the stone missed, a splinter from it injured the Buddha's foot, and this was said to be a consequence of an unskillful action in a remote past life. In extreme cases, enlightenment is the only answer to negative karma as the life story of the great Tibetan yogi Milarepa confirms. 
He and his guru Mapa were only too well aware of the gravity of his situation. He had committed multiple murder to avenge the cruel treatment of his family, and realised that his only hope of avoiding rebirth in hell was to gain enlightenment in this very lifetime. His situation was like that of a driver who has lost control of his car. It is about to crash as a result of his bad driving, but if he can jump out, he stands a chance of surviving. If you can, as it were, throw yourself clear of conditioned existence, as Milarepa did on gaining enlightenment, then whatever might have happened to you if you had stayed within the six realms is of no concern. The same dramatic escape would seem to have been engineered in the case of the Buddha's disciple Angulimala, who had been a notorious bandit and murderer, but having seen the error of his ways, became a monk and eventually an arhant. The only negative karma vipaka that he had to endure, which he did patiently, was the harsh treatment of villagers who recognised him and threw stones at him. Of course, not all the fruits of previous actions are painful. If you have acted skillfully in your previous existences, the consequences will be positive both for you and for everyone with whom you come into contact. The benefits of ethically skillful actions are attested and exemplified by the great Buddhist saints, who may in some cases have walked the spiritual path of many lifetimes. Their biographies, which are traditionally regarded as teachings in themselves, to be recalled and dwelt upon and contemplated to inspire one's practice of the Dharma, demonstrate in their different ways how the ideal can be realised in an individual human life, often out of humble and sometimes very unlikely beginnings. In the end, looking back through all the strange twists and turns of a lifetime, a noble pattern emerges of a life integrating itself, sometimes apparently against all the odds, around that ideal. The message is that if you have cultivated a strong will to follow the transcendental path, you will be impelled, seemingly inevitably, towards spiritual attainment. Even hearing about the lives of ordinary Buddhists, and over the years I have listened to the life stories of a good many, can leave one with the distinct impression that their progress towards the spiritual path was inevitable, as though there was a goal implicit in everything they did, a goal that gradually became clearer to them as they experienced more of life and realised what they really wanted to be and to do. You might not realise the path your life is taking until you look back on it, but when you do become aware of your purpose, it might seem uncannily as though your life has had a direction of its own, independent of your conscious volition. As that direction emerges into consciousness, with the arising of some degree of clear comprehension, it is intensified and you can pursue it ever more vigorously. This might provoke considerable resistance within you, perhaps reinforced by circumstances and by the values of the society you are living in. But when you become aware of your higher purpose, however much you kick against it, you will never be able to forget it entirely. The traditional Indian image for this state is graphic. You are a snake that has swallowed a frog and can neither get it down nor throw it up. But there is a more delicate metaphor. It is said that, just as the flower is implicit in the seed, the goal of spiritual growth is implicit in human consciousness. For all human beings, not only saints and sages, the implicit purpose of human existence is to evolve and develop. To grow in consciousness, we just need to look carefully at the past and try to discern that trajectory so that we can continue to move in that direction. If we look carefully enough, we will always find that thread of meaning running through our lives, and it is the function of the Dharma to help us to find it. Not that it is easy to spot. Some people carry over from the past sufficient strength of purpose and clarity to help them find it, 
but for others the adverse weight of past karma and the vagaries of life in the world conspire to prevent the pattern from emerging into consciousness at all. Life is not entirely determined by karma. So much depends on circumstances and plain chance. Even making contact with the Buddha's teachings might seem to be sheer accident, a matter of glancing at a poster or picking up a book. Of course, such chances depend on whoever took the trouble to put that poster up or publish that book, which is why it is so important to make the Buddhist path known to others. In ways we cannot know, it can be like throwing a lifeline to a drowning swimmer, and they will eagerly clutch it and haul themselves in if they get a chance. However it comes about, when we become aware of that sense of direction, we should do whatever we can to dwell upon it, intensify our experience of it, and allow it to permeate and transform us. Once you are conscious of yourself unfolding within the framework of conditionality, you can make a directed effort to strengthen the process of growth and remove obstacles from its path. This is mindfulness of purpose, Sampajanya. Just as when setting out on a journey, you might resolve that you are not going to linger or allow yourself to be turned aside or distracted. Developing mindfulness of purpose means becoming more and more conscious of the goal of growth and development. Because it is the purpose of your life, it is the implicit purpose of all your activities, and you can aim to let it gradually pervade every aspect of your life. Traditionally, Buddhism has given the goal a name, enlightenment. But even the shortest journey can be fraught with difficulties, so it is little wonder if, from where we are now, enlightenment seems too vague and remote a destination. Even if one has seen the limited nature of mundane goals, and this is by no means easy to do, the ideal of enlightenment can still seem very far off. One may have no intellectual doubts about the principles of Buddhism, but translating that rational understanding into lived experience means having a clear idea not only of the goal, but also of the steps necessary to achieve it. Without that, we won't make much progress in the spiritual life. We need intermediate goals between the ultimate objective and where we are at present. Goals we can actually see in the process of being achieved. Buddhist mythology tells the story of Amitabha, a Buddha who created an entire realm, a pure land, complete with jeweled trees, birds singing the Dharma, and all manner of wonders. In other words, perfect conditions for the living of the Dharma life. But although he was able to build a pure land for all sentient beings, Amitabha started out as an ordinary bhikkhu named Dharmakara, and he must have moved from one limited goal to another, just as we can. The idea of building a cosmic pure land is no doubt far beyond us. But if someone told you they had managed to get hold of some premises and wanted to turn them into a meditation centre, you would probably be able to envisage what that would mean and you could summon every particle of faith and determination you had to help you achieve it. So long as you were prepared to throw yourself into whatever task was needed to be done, you could be confident that the new meditation centre would be opened some day. And having done it, you could set yourself further, more demanding goals, and thereby achieve things you would never have dreamed of when you first set out. So long as you keep that clarity of perspective, a series of proximate, short-term goals stretching into the future can take you all the way to enlightenment itself, however unlikely that might seem from where you are now. Short-term goals give us something concrete to work on, and an effective measure of our progress, the measure being in terms of the spiritual benefit to ourselves or to others. We can approach this just as we would approach anything else we wanted to achieve. 
If, for example, you're going to embark on a course of study, you might select your reading matter and aim to cover a clearly defined field of inquiry. Then write up your conclusions or discuss them with other people within a certain time schedule. That would help you monitor your progress and give you confidence in your ability to achieve the goals you set. The important thing is to enter every activity having formed a clear intention and not to lose sight of your purpose even in the midst of the complexity of life. This is what mindfulness of purpose, sometimes called clear comprehension, essentially is. Developing the habit of recollecting one's goal often enough and deeply enough to ensure that one's life is organised around it. To live with clarity of intention and unity of purpose suggests not only an appreciation of cause and effect, but also the moral sensitivity that is fundamental to true individuality. When you lose clear comprehension of purpose, you haven't just lost your mindfulness. There is a lapse of your moral character, a break in the continuity of your being. So far as the implicit goal of growth and self-knowledge is concerned, it is a kind of lapse into unconsciousness. And in this state of spiritual unconsciousness, your instincts and habitual patterns of greed and aversion will be likely to take over. Whatever kind of worldly sense of continuity you are left with will be antithetical to any real unity of purpose. It is mindfulness in the sense of a recollected, purposive quality that makes us capable of creative action. And without it, even reflective consciousness is impossible, because there is no basis other than habit from which to act. A very unsatisfactory and uncomfortable state to be in. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha exhorts the monk to apply clear comprehension in all the activities of daily life. Bending and stretching, wearing robes, carrying the begging bowl, eating, drinking, chewing, savouring, attending to the calls of nature, speaking and keeping silent, all are carried out with awareness of what you are doing and why so that that aspiration is allowed to permeate everything you do. Any activity, however small or apparently insignificant, can be done with a sense of purpose. You can even fall asleep mindfully, with a sense of when and why your period of rest is necessary. If you have to be up in the morning at 6.30 for meditation, your clear comprehension might take the form of making sure that you get to bed in good time, so that you have enough sleep and won't just feel like a lion when the time comes to meditate. If you are serious and passionate about reaching your spiritual goal, it is absolutely necessary to take a regular, disciplined approach to what you do. Success, as in any other enterprise, sport or art or business, depends on establishing a disciplined and committed lifestyle. It is strange that people are often reluctant to adopt regular habits, because these do, in fact, make life easier. If you live haphazardly, just doing what you feel like, when you feel like it, you can end up not finding the time or inclination for things you know will benefit you. But with a regular routine, you will still, for example, sit to meditate, even when you don't feel like it, because you are aware of the benefits of doing so. You can take the likely outcomes of particular courses of action for granted. You don't have to reassess them every time you think about doing them. It is equally important, however, not to get too rigid about this. The path is not a set of rules that you can stick to mechanically and be sure of getting the results you want. At dinner time you might be able to get away with shoveling food into your mouth in the knowledge that your stomach will take care of the rest of the process. But it isn't like that with meditation, puja or dharma study. These practices are designed to be liberating, but if you lose touch with why you are doing them, they become so many obstacles to your progress. Mindfulness is an intelligent, responsive awareness to ever-changing conditions. 
if the urgent need to develop insight gets lost in the lacklustre business of keeping everything ticking over, it is time to look again at the balance of your life. This loss of perspective is essentially what has happened in many of the traditional Buddhist cultures of the East. In some Buddhist countries, the stated aim of spiritual practice for lay people is not to gain transcendental insight, but to acquire what is called merit, or punya, through acts of devotion towards shrines and stupas, and acts of generosity towards the monastic order. That merit might bear fruit in an auspicious rebirth, but it will not bring about insight in this life, which lets the lay follower off the hook, because anything further in the way of spiritual progress is by definition impossible. If you want to practice effectively, this is the popular belief, you need to become a monk or nun. And if you don't get ordained, there's no need to change the way you live. So long as you observe the five ethical precepts, at least on special occasions, you need ask nothing more of yourself. The monk, on the other hand, can safely assume that he is practicing the Dharma effectively, simply because he wears the robe. As long as he is visibly worthy of the lay person's offerings through the strict observance of ethical discipline, everything will be fine, regardless of his mental states or motivations. This unwritten contract between monks and lay people serves to preserve the monastic community and ensure its continuing support, but it entirely fails to acknowledge that there are certain ways of going about your business in life that hold you back in your spiritual development, and there are others that help you to progress, whatever your overall lifestyle. The aim of the Buddhist path for everybody is the transformation of consciousness and this requires active choices. Without a positive engagement with the principles of Buddhism and a commitment to living in accordance with them in all areas of one's life, the precepts and practices are devalued to the level of mere group custom, enabling people to settle into social roles which vaguely imply that their spiritual practice is effective. From the perspective of the Buddha's own day, however, there could be only one difference between Buddhists, not between monastic and lay people, but between people who are fully committed to growth and transformation and people who are less willing or less able to commit themselves. Without this commitment, the whole edifice of monastic life is liable to turn into a mundane institution, preoccupied with its own preservation. It is easier to fall into the trap of understanding religious practice in this purely external way than we might like to think. These days some Western Buddhists work in rights livelihood businesses whose aim is for even the most mundane tasks to be carried out with awareness or clear comprehension of one's true goal in life. But is it all too easy to lose sight of this? The short-term demands of the work can take priority over reflections on your higher purpose so that you lose contact with it, at least for the time being. Your work is meant to support your spiritual practice. It is not just a job. But if you lose that perspective, the ideal of right livelihood as a limb of the Noble Eightfold Path disappears too, and with it the ideal of enlightenment, to which every aspect of that path is dedicated. As the vision behind your daily work fades, you are likely to find yourself less able to contact any depth of positive emotion, and your capacity for effective meditation might slip away too. You might even start to get annoyed with your co-workers, because they don't seem to be pulling their weight or engaging as fully with the work as you are yourself. That is a sure sign that something is wrong. The problem is that, having lost awareness of the deeper currents in your life, you have allowed mere circumstances to take over. This can happen in any line of work. We all need to review what we are doing from time to time and remind ourselves 
what we are really trying to achieve. If your short-term goals have begun to assume an importance that makes no sense to anyone else, it may be that you have become too dependent on success and too upset by potential failure. It is, of course, natural to be upset by failure and uplifted by success, but you must keep a check on it, or you'll end up depending on constant reinsurance from others. If you are experiencing a desperate need to meet your targets for their own sake, you are clearly attaching too much importance to something that was only ever meant to be a means to an end. Despite their different emphases, mindfulness and clear comprehension of purpose often appear as a compound term in Pali, sati sampajanya, and the two words can be considered to be so close in meaning as to be virtually interchangeable. There is no precise word in English for this kind of recollection, and it is difficult to come up with a definition that evokes its spirit. One might say that it is going about one's daily life without ever forgetting one's higher purpose, but that still doesn't quite bring out the full sense of sampajanya, because forgetting refers to something you are trying to remember from the past rather than the future goal to which you aspire. Sampajanya has more of a sense of insight about it than the more psychological idea of memory. You know not only what you are doing, but why you are doing it. It is in this twofold sense that the Buddha exhorts his followers to be aware, quote, clearly comprehending and mindful of the four foundations of mindfulness. The subtle interplay between awareness and recollection has the effect of integrating one's whole experience and continually re-establishing a sense of harmony and direction. Sati Sampajanya has a balancing and integrating quality that permeates every area of experience to bring about a whole way of life concentrated not so much on a future goal as on the dynamic cumulative nature of the path itself. Once you have learned to recognize and cultivate this precious quality, you will never lose touch with the truth that our existence is not confined to the present, and that what we will become depends to a very great extent on what we do now. Chapter 3 Breathing The Sutta and how, bhikkhus, does a bhikkhu abide contemplating the body as a body? Here, a bhikkhu, gone to the forest, or to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut, sits down, having folded his legs crosswise, set his body erect, and established mindfulness in front of him. Ever mindful, he breathes in, and mindful, he breathes out. Having laid down the four foundations of mindfulness, the Buddha goes on to recommend a particularly accessible method of developing mindfulness, the mindfulness of breathing. The fact that it is accessible is very important. The plain truth is, and we had better face this squarely, that awareness of any kind is not easy to develop. The Buddha's method is therefore to start by encouraging us to develop awareness of the aspect of our experience that is closest to us, the body. Even this is not as easy as one might think. The first of the four foundations may be mindfulness of the body, but it is hard to focus on the body as a whole. It is such a complex thing, within which all sorts of processes are going on at the same time. To lead your awareness towards a broader experience of the body, it is therefore best to begin by focusing on the breath. Breathing is a simple bodily activity, providing a relatively stable object of attention that is both calming and capable of sustaining one's interest. On this basis, you can go on to become aware of your bodily sensations and even of your feelings and thoughts, which are still more subtle and difficult to follow. The breath is available to us at every moment of our lives, 
and becoming aware of it has a calming effect at stressful times. As we know from the received wisdom of our own culture, take a deep breath. But it is possible to cultivate a more systematic awareness of the breathing through a meditation which is widely practiced throughout the Buddhist world, the mindfulness of breathing, in Pali Anapanasati, which some say was the meditation the Buddha was practicing when he gained enlightenment. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha launches straight into a description of how the bhikkhu should go about this practice. He is directed to go into the depths of the forest, or to the foot of a tree, or just to an empty place. Then, sitting down with his legs crossed, he is to keep his body erect and his mindfulness alert, or established in front of him, and start to become aware of his breathing. Thus we learn straight away that the right place, the right time, and the right posture are all important for successful meditation. The right place, we gather, is a place of solitude. In the Buddha's time, of course, there was plenty of space in the depths of the forest for meditators to sit there for long periods without being disturbed. But I think the Buddha's instruction here means something more. We need to imagine what it would be like to take up this practice if you had always lived in the traditional Indian family, which was the core of Brahminical society in the Buddha's day. An Indian village, with all its noise and bustle, was hardly conducive to the development of mental calm, and the psychological and moral pull of the family group would have been just as inimical to spiritual practice. Even today in India, if you live in a traditional extended family, it can be very difficult to steer your life in a direction not dictated by your family. For anyone seeking an awakening to truth, simply going forth to the undisturbed solitude of the forest, abandoning anything to do with home and family life, at least for a while, was and continues to be a major step. Finding solitude is just as much of a challenge for us in the West today, although for us solitude might mean getting a respite from the world and worldly concerns rather than literally getting away from other people. Indeed, the companionship of other people following the same spiritual tradition as yourself can be a great source of encouragement, especially when you're just starting out. To meditate in isolation, you need to know what you're doing and be very determined. It is all too easy for discouraging doubts to arise about whether you're doing the practice properly, and in the absence of an experience guide, you might lose interest in meditation altogether. While the Buddha's instruction to seek out the foot of a tree certainly suggests finding a place where you are likely to be undisturbed for a while, it does not necessarily mean going off into the depths of the forest or isolating yourself from other meditators. People didn't always meditate alone, even in the Buddha's day. The Pali Suttas contained striking descriptions of the Buddha and his disciples sitting and meditating together, sometimes in very large numbers. We come upon such a scene at the beginning of the Samanyapala Sutta. On a full moon night, King Ajatasattu decides to have his elephants saddled up, all five hundred of them, and ride with his entourage deep into the forest in search of the Buddha. It is quite a long way, and the king, who has a guilty conscience, is beset by all sorts of fears as they journey through the darkness. But at last they come upon the Buddha, seated in meditation with twelve hundred and fifty monks, all of them perfectly concentrated and spread out before him like a vast, clear lake. The silence, says the Sutta, fills the guilty king, he has murdered his own father to gain the throne, with a nameless dread, making the hairs on his body stand on end. But he is sufficiently moved to ask to become a lay disciple of the Buddha on the spot. Since those early times... Buddhists throughout the tradition, especially in the Zen schools, which place a particular emphasis on meditation, 
have well understood the benefits of collective practice. The Westerner, learning to meditate, is quite likely to do so alone, buying a book on the subject and beginning the practice in the comfort of his or her own home, but this is not to be recommended. It is hard to tell from the printed page how much experience the author has, and in any case no book can cover every contingency. There is also the danger that you will end up just reading about Buddhist meditation and never getting around to doing any. It is certainly possible to learn the basic techniques from a book, but if you can, it is worth seeking out a meditation teacher and other meditators with whom to practice. As for the Buddha's instruction that the bhikkhu should sit cross-legged, this posture is recommended because it spreads the weight of the body more broadly and evenly than any other sitting position, and thus gives stability, and enables you to sit comfortably for a long time. However, while it would have come naturally to the people of the Buddhist time and culture to sit cross-legged on the floor, we might find it more difficult. If so, any posture can be adopted, whether on the floor or on a chair, as long as it is stable and comfortable. Incidentally, this is another reason to go along to a meditation class to get some help with working out a suitable meditation posture. Next, the monk is advised to keep his mindfulness alert or established in front of him. Some commentators suggest that this is an instruction to be mindful of the breath, which is, in a way, in front of you, but the meaning is probably less literal, referring simply to being undistracted. It's rather like the behaviour prescribed for a monk going for alms. He's supposed to keep his gaze on the ground, about six feet in front of him, looking neither to the left nor right. This discipline is a very good preparation for meditation, helping one to become more aware of what one is doing and why, so that one does not let one's mind stray into unskillful thoughts. The Sutta Breathing in long, he understands, I breathe in long. Or breathing out long, he understands, I breathe out long. Breathing in short, he understands, I breathe in short. Or breathing out short, he understands, I breathe out short. The precise details of the mindfulness of breathing are not recorded in any text, perhaps because the detailed ins and outs of the practice have traditionally been handed down from teacher to pupil by word of mouth. One can see the teaching of meditation in classes or groups as a continuation of that tradition. But the best method to start with is probably the traditional Theravadin practice of Anapanasati. This is divided into four stages, the first two of which involve counting the breaths to stop the mind from wandering and help you become aware of the breathing's dynamic yet gentle regularity. In the first stage, you count at the end of each outbreath. According to the commentaries, this corresponds to the phrase in the Satipatthana Sutta, which describes the meditator as knowing. I am breathing in a long breath. There is nothing sacrosanct about this counting. In a sense, it doesn't matter what number you count to. In some traditions, you don't count at all. For example, there is a Thai method whereby you prevent the mind from straying by combining the inward and outward breathing with the pronunciation of the syllables bud and do. Buddha means awake. Other traditions go to the opposite extreme. Some Tibetan yogis count on indefinitely, even into the thousands. The Satipatthana Sutra itself makes no mention of counting. But the best method for the beginner is probably to count the breaths in groups of ten, as they do in the Theravadin tradition. Counting to five or less tends to restrict the mind unnecessarily, while going beyond ten involves paying too much attention to keeping track of which number you've reached. 
although you should be careful not to become so preoccupied with counting that you forget to concentrate on the breathing itself, it is a good idea to keep counting in these early stages of the practice. Experienced meditators may find that counting obstructs their concentration, but in that case, the counting tends to fall away quite naturally. If you are going to modify the practice, you need to be able to recognize the state of concentration you have reached and what to do to deepen it, and that calls for a good deal of experience. If you are a relative beginner, you may think that you are concentrating when all that has happened is that you have slipped into a light doze as your thoughts wander to and fro. Some beginners do become deeply absorbed in meditation, but it is rare to be able to stay concentrated. It is best to adopt a systematic method that will help you keep up the momentum of the practice. Once the first stage has been established, the sutta tells us that the meditator knows that he is breathing in a short breath. This can be taken to refer to the second stage of the anapana practice, in which you change the emphasis slightly by counting before each in-breath, rather than after each out-breath. Presumably a correspondence between the sutta's instructions at this point and the first two stages of the anapana method is made, because the breath has a natural tendency to become a little longer in the first stage and a little shorter in the second. But you don't deliberately make the breaths shorter or longer. You just watch and count them as they come and go, steadily becoming more and more aware of the whole breathing process as you do so. In the early stages of meditation, much of your effort will be taken up with drawing the disparate energies of your mind and body together. And this involves recognising the various ways in which the mind resists the process of deepening concentration. Traditionally, these forms of resistance are called the five hindrances. That is, doubt, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, and restlessness. More will be said about this unsettling list of obstacles in a later chapter. Here it will suffice to say that, to begin with, one's effort in meditation is mainly directed towards avoiding them. Buddha Gosha's commentary on the Satipatthana Sutta, Buddha Gosha was a celebrated scholar of the Pali texts who lived in the 4th century CE, compares the mind at this stage to a calf which, having been reared on wild cow's milk, has been taken away from its mother and tethered to a post. At first, unsettled and ill at ease in its unfamiliar surroundings, the calf dashes to and fro, trying to escape. But however much it struggles, it is held fast by the rope tethering it to the post. The rope, of course, symbolises mindfulness. If your mindfulness holds firm, your mind will eventually be brought to a point where, like the wild calf, it finally stops trying to get away and settles down to rest in the inward and outward flow of the breath. For all its qualities of strength and steadfastness in the face of distraction, mindfulness is neither forceful nor aggressive in its quiet taming of the wayward mind. Like the rope, mindfulness has a certain pliancy, if you fix your attention too rigidly on the object of meditation, subtle states of concentration will have little opportunity to arise. The aim is a gradual process of unification. You guide your energies firmly until they harmonize about a single point, without strain or tension, and you are absorbed in the breathing for its own sake. A deep contentment will then lead quite naturally into concentration as the traces of distraction fade away. The Sutta He trains thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing the whole body of breath. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing the whole body of breath. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the body formation. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the body formation. 
just as a skilled turner or his apprentice, when making a long turn, understands, I make a long turn, or when making a short turn, understands, I make a short turn. In the Anapana method, the first two stages of the practice are succeeded by two more, in the course of which your awareness of the breathing becomes increasingly refined. In stage three, you drop the counting altogether and give your attention to the breathing process as a whole, experiencing your breath rising and falling continuously and without effort, like a great ocean wave. You follow the breath going into the lungs, you feel it there, and you continue to experience it fully as it is breathed out. Note that the future tense used here, I shall breathe in, simply signifies the meditator's intention. It carries no suggestion that the breathing should be controlled in any way. Nor should the injunction to verbalise, even silently, be taken literally. If you become deeply concentrated, there will be no mental activity at all. Another possible source of confusion is the expression whole body of breath, which means simply the whole breath, not a subtle counterpart of the physical body, like the Hindu concept of prana. When you are experiencing the whole breath body, it is not just an awareness from the outside, but a total experience. You are identifying yourself with the breath. After some time, this subtle stage gives way to the fourth stage of the practice, which is more subtle still. Now you bring your attention to the first touch of the breath about your nostrils or upper lip, maintaining a delicate, minutely observed awareness of the breath's texture as it enters and leaves your body. Buddha Gosha compares this to a carpenter sawing timber, who keeps his attention fixed not on the saw as it moves back and forth, but on the spot where the saw's teeth are cutting into the wood. The sutta itself provides the analogy of a skilful wood turner who knows precisely what kind of turn, long or short, he is making. For most of us the reference will be somewhat obscure, but this is the kind of rural image the Buddha often used, and it would have been immediately clear to the people of village India in his own time. The basic principle of turning remains the same to this day. The turner shapes the wood by rotating a piece of timber at speed and applying various cutting tools to the surface as it spins. In the Buddha's day, this would have been a very simple process by which a strip of wood would be peeled from the rotating timber in either a long or a short traverse. The turner's whole attention has to be concentrated on the point at which the timber revolves, and this demands steady concentration, because a hesitation would leave a mark which would be hard to remove. Likewise, by means of the meditation technique, your consciousness becomes increasingly refined and you become more keenly aware of the breathing. As you bring your physical and mental energies into a state of tranquility and dynamic balance, you steadily identify yourself with the breath until there is only the subtlest mental activity around the breathing process. You are simply and brightly aware. When you are just starting the practice, your experience of the breath will be more or less the same as usual. But as the meditation moves into a different gear, you will perceive it more subtly, and it will become much more interesting to you, as though it were an entirely new experience. This signals that you are entering the phase known as access concentration, or upachara samadhi, a state in which meditation becomes lighter and more enjoyable and distractions are easier to recognize and deal with. You feel buoyant, as though you are floating or expanding, and everything flows naturally and easily. This phase of meditation might be accompanied by experiences called samapati. These are difficult to describe because they vary so much from person to person and from one time to another. They might take a visual form, perhaps a certain luminosity before the mind's eye, or arise as a kind of symbol in your state of awareness. 
All such phenomena are just signs that your concentration is becoming deeper. Your aim is to concentrate all the more deeply on your breathing, leaving these experiences to look after themselves, not dwelling on them or getting too interested in them. Gradually, if you keep your momentum, you will be able to go just a little further than access concentration to enter full mental absorption or anapana samadhi, otherwise known in Pali as jhana and in Sanskrit as dhyana. In dhyana you enter a crucial stage, passing beyond the psychological process of integrating the disparate aspects of yourself into true concentration. As long as you remain immersed in this state, you are no longer dependent on the physical senses for anchorage, a statement which makes more sense in experience than in words, it has to be said. Absorption in dhyana is inherently pleasurable. It is a highly positive state of integration and harmony, which moves consciousness, at least temporarily, into the realm of genuinely spiritual experience. It has longer lasting effects too. It is what is sometimes called weighty karma. That is, it has very powerful positive karmic consequences. It is a mistake to think of dhyana as passive, mild and restful in a pleasantly vague way. It is an active, powerful state. But for all its skillfulness, dhyana is by no means the final goal of the mindfulness of breathing. Its main importance lies in the fact that it is the basis for the development of transcendental insight. The Sutta In this way he abides contemplating the body as a body internally, or he abides contemplating the body as a body externally, or he abides contemplating the body as a body both internally and externally or else he abides contemplating in the body its arising factors, or he abides contemplating in the body its vanishing factors, or he abides contemplating in the body both its arising and vanishing factors. Or else mindfulness that there is a body is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness. And he abides independent, not clinging to anything in the world. That is how Bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body. The way Buddhist meditation practices are described can make it seem as though some of them are designed to develop concentration, shamatha, while others are meant to develop insight, vipassana. In fact, though, all these practices are part of a single system of mental development, leading towards higher states of awareness. The aim of all Buddhist practice is ultimately transcendental insight, and there is thus no need to draw too clear a line between shamatha and vipassana meditation. The process is essentially the same. You start by becoming aware of the aspects of existence most immediately apparent to you, your own body and its functions. And then you narrow the field of concentration in order to cultivate the dhyanas. This preparatory stage can take the form of the mindfulness of breathing, or the metabhavna, the development of loving-kindness, or even a practice traditionally thought of as vipassana, the six-element practice, for instance. Whatever the method, you have to develop concentration as a first step if the reflective aspect of the practice is to be effective. Having narrowed the field of your attention to deepen your experience, you expand that field to increase the breadth of your vision, placing your experience of concentration, intensely absorbed as it is, within the broader perspective of vipassana. Without these two aspects, the harmonization of consciousness and the cultivation of insight, no system of meditation is complete. One tends not to think of the mindfulness of breathing as an insight practice, but in principle it is, just as much as practices more usually designated vipassana. 
The Satipatthana Sutta's description of the practice certainly suggests that it is. Vipassana is presented here as a stage of meditation, that stage of meditation which follows on naturally from the concentration and tranquility established by the mindfulness of breathing. As this section of the sutta moves beyond the technical description of the establishment of concentration and around the breath, it goes into a series of more general reflections concerning the nature of breathing. The contemplation of the breath internally and externally, and of the origination and dissolution factors of the breath. Through these reflections, this is the intention, you eventually come to grasp the essential fragility of the breathing process. So it is possible to take a reflective attitude to the breath, as well as dwelling on the physical experience of breathing. Although these reflections are suggested here in the Satipatthana Sutta, such a reflective attitude is seldom mentioned in the Theravadin tradition, while in the Mahayana, Vipassana practices, such as the Six Element practice, may take over where the mindfulness of breathing leaves off. No doubt the Six Element practice could be said to provide a more comprehensive method of channeling the same kinds of reflection. But to reflect on the nature of the breath is in essence to reflect on what the Buddhist tradition calls the three lakshanas, the three characteristics or marks of mundane existence, that it is impermanent, unsatisfactory and insubstantial. And what could be more directly related to insight than that? The Sutta instructs the practitioner to live contemplating in the body its arising factors or its vanishing factors. The meaning of this is quite straightforward. You contemplate all the factors or conditions that go to produce the breathing process and in the absence of which it does not take place. It is essentially a recognition of the breath's contingent nature. As well as bringing to mind the physiological conditions affecting the rise and fall of the breath, you can also reflect that the breathing, as an intrinsic part of the body as a whole, is ultimately dependent upon the ignorance and craving that, under the law of karma, have brought that body into existence. The very impermanence of the body, you can further reflect, gives rise to its unsatisfactoriness. This is the second of the three marks of conditioned existence, the truth that all conditioned things are unsatisfactory, even potentially painful, because they cannot last forever. The breath, like the body, arises and passes away, and one day our breathing and our life will come to an end. To bring this reflection home, you can call to mind the inherent fragility of the breathing. Like the body, it is a delicate, vulnerable thing that is always susceptible to the unpredictable forces of the natural world. This inherent instability is something we share with all sentient beings, indeed with everything, which is presumably what is meant in the Sutta by the exhortation to contemplate the body externally as well as internally. It could conceivably mean looking at the body from the outside as well as experiencing it subjectively from within, but it is usually taken to mean contemplation of the physical experience of others. In the later stages of the mindfulness of breathing, when you might be concentrating more on the development of insight, you can recollect that just as you are breathing, so too are all other living beings, or at least those that do breathe. In this way you cultivate a feeling of solidarity with all other forms of life. As far as I know, this sort of reflection forms no specific part of the mindfulness of breathing, as it is usually practised. But it is the natural result of sustained practice. You realise in a very immediate way that just as you are breathing in and out, so too are other beings. The mindfulness of breathing, practised in this way, thus provides a corrective against an alienated or one-sided approach to spiritual life. 
it seems a shame that it is not standard practice. In reflecting that we share with all breathing beings the same body of air and the same material elements, we approach the third mark of conditioned existence, the fact that the distinction we make between ourselves and others is quite arbitrary. This is the truth of insubstantiality, the fact that the discrete and permanent self is only an illusion. We depend on other people for our existence, and we are very much like them. And when we die, the material elements of which we are all composed will disperse across the universe once more. The Sutta thus refers to the monk's body not as his body, but as the body. There is no question here of I or mine. It's just the body. Reflecting in this way is not meant to alienate you from your body. You are trying to see it as an impersonal process, part of the universal rise and fall of things. It is another move towards a sense of solidarity with other beings. In this way, the Sutta leads the meditator through the shamatha stages of calming and integrating consciousness around the breathing, through the various levels of absorbed concentration, and on to the contemplation of the inherent truths of conditioned existence, in preparation for the arising of transcendental insight. How the effort to develop insight within meditation is made is quite difficult to explain. You have to look actively for insight into the true nature of things, but without looking for it in any particular direction or in any particular way. It is a sort of active receptivity. You are actively holding yourself open to insight. These two aspects of the practice, receptivity to something outside yourself, so to speak, and an active searching, are equally important. The quest for insight demands exertion, not intellectual exertion, but a meditative, intuitive searching, not trying to think your way to reality, but trying to see it directly. This is not to say that insight will necessarily arise directly as a result of insight practice. Sometimes it happens that you are trying too hard or in not quite the right way. When you release that effort, the momentum of your practice may continue to build up and insight may suddenly strike you out of the blue when you are doing something ordinary like peeling potatoes. There is no situation, whether positive or negative, pleasant or painful, in which insight may not arise. All that is needed is mindfulness. This section of the Sutta is therefore less about what you do in the seated meditation than about what you take away from it. This is perhaps why it is so concise. Perhaps it is not advocating a thoroughgoing practice of vipassana at the end of the mindfulness of breathing, so much as simply making the point that mindfulness, especially in its more reflective, insightful aspects, is something to be carried over into all areas of our experience. Mindfulness is not just what you do when you are sitting at the foot of a tree in the forest or wherever you choose to meditate. Having clarified and unified your consciousness by means of the mindfulness of breathing, you are meant to reflect that the breathing is a precarious and fragile thing and to carry that awareness with you all the time. This section of the Sutta prepares the ground for what is to come later on when the transition between seated meditation and the practice of mindfulness in daily life is addressed. It suggests that a continuity is established by becoming conscious of the body's impermanence, its internal and external qualities, and its existence simply as a body, regardless of your mental constructions around it. <laughs>